Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to the 130th episode of Stories of Service, Ordinary People Who Do Extraordinary Work. And I am the host of Stories of Service, Teresa Carpenter. And today we have another amazing guest. I'm so excited to talk to him. He is my second flag officer. You may re recall that I, I did have, um, gosh, I, Greg's last name, he'll just kill me, but the, the bipolar general, I had him on two star and he's a, on a real big mission to do mental health. And now I have another retired uh, two star admiral uh, who is on to talk about leadership. Mike, and I'm, I want to get it right, Manazer? Manazer. Manazer. Mike yeah. Manazer, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. And I'm so happy we're alive today. By the way, did I tell you 130 is my very favorite number? Is it? Why? Oh, yeah. Just because, because I'm on with you. <laughs> oh, well, it's, it's 130th is the uh, premiere episode. Like I said, whenever I get to interview people of your caliber and of your leadership, and as I said in, in the intro, who have done hard things, it's always a pleasure because I believe that we all can learn something from people that have put themselves in some of the most stressful positions. So I'm going to read a little bit about you, and then I'm going to ask some questions. If you're joining me from YouTube, please hit that subscribe. If you're joining me from any of my socials, please share this conversation and tell your friends about it. And at this point, if you want to have any questions, you can put those in the comments. We'll get to the ones that we can. And if I can't get to them during the broadcast, I'll make sure to get to them afterwards. So as I said, I always love learning from people who do hard things. And, and those are the people that really show us how to overcome life setbacks. As a fighter pilot, a carrier commanding officer, and a strike group commander, he's worked in the highest stress jobs and he stayed calm under those immense pressures and inspired people. And today we're going to discuss how you can have that same momentum to achieve any goal going forward. Rear Admiral Mike Manazer served in the United States Navy for 36 years, retiring in July 2017, joining the Boeing Company in, September, in sep that September. He um, is headquartered in D.C., and he trained as a naval aviator and ship captain, ship captain flying 370 50 fighter hours in the F-14 Tomcat and F-18 Super Hornet. He has done 1,240 arrested landings on different aircraft carriers with 15 overseas deployments and a graduate of Top Gun. And due to the ever-increasing leadership responsibilities, leading 350 to more than 10,000 and commanding a Navy fighter squadron, a supply ship, aircraft carrier, USS Nimitz, Carrier Strike Group 8, and embarked on the Dwight D. Eisenhower. And then upon retiring, he said, that's not enough, and decided to write a book called Learn How to Lead, which is 33 powerful stories of leadership and learning. Mike's Maxims, a companion to the Lead to Win book, as well as two short eBooks about fate and trust, all can be found on Amazon and other retail outlets, and also authors a weekly newsletter on discrete leadership topics. Welcome again, Mike. Wow. I want to, you know, I want to meet that guy. <laughs> hey, it's well, we're just you, Teresa. I, uh, I'll tell you what, there's only one thing that I, that I'll push back a little bit on. Uh, I'm not an extraordinary leader and I always found the opportunity to, to, um, connect with people at a human level. And I want to talk about how, how to be a better leader that way. I've been thinking about it quite a bit. A lot of the leadership materials out there talk about what to do. And I think about who to be um, as a leader so you can get high performance. And, and the cool thing is I got to do all those really neat things in the Navy and they were, they were really awesome. And then, and then I got to, you know, lead with a whole bunch of other people that I was actually closer to than being, you know, being the boss, the title, Admiral, Captain, Skipper, you know, those kind of things that you just talked about. And your, your, focus on heart-centered leadership is right in my wheelhouse. Well, right in mine as well. And I do believe that this is the future heart-centered leadership. We just had a diversity and inclusion event that I'll be posting about soon on my official pages. And I do believe that this is the way that the new leadership must be in order to gain respect and trust from their followers. And I would like to know from your perspective, and we'll get into your bio in just a minute, but because you brought it up, I, I got to ask, why do you think the leadership books of the past or leadership guidance in the past did focus on what to do and not who to be? Um, because I think it's easier to tell somebody what to do than to recommend what kind of a personality um, or, or I should say how to use your personality to be a better leader. Um, I think that moves into, you know, psychology instead of leadership and, I, I'm, I'm having this sort of burgeoning epiphany in my head. It's just kind of coming forward thinking about this 
this differentiation that if you look at any of these these books out here or look at the things you know no. on, online you generally have you know actions and things like that so um and i i just think that that if you use your title to lead you're never gonna you know you're not going to get the best results and i I've, I've known this for a long time and it's it's so easy if you have to say do it because I'm the boss or because I said so, because you get frustrated. Um, you're not going to get the same response. And, you know, leading people is the same. People only want two things, one, to feel valued and two, to be part of something bigger than themselves. And so those are the only two things. So if you if you tell people the why of what they're doing and you value them every day for their perspective, coming to work, you know, where they mm -hmm. come from, their background, their points of view, you will get better performance. I get asked a lot like, you know, Hey, Mike, what's the difference between leading in the military and, and leading in the civilian world, you know, at, 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 at the same level? Like in the military, you just order people, right? Well, you can. can. But I found in my in my 36 years in the Navy, if I order people to do something, I'm not going to get the same results. If I influence them from my connection with them as a human and a friend, that this is the right thing to do, they will get better results doing that. By the way, one thing I want to tell you about, and this occurs to me all the time. You did a diversity and inclusion thing that you're going to cover here. Diversity, when you look around the room, is a metric. You can look around a room and determine whether it's a diverse group or not. If you don't include everybody, the diversity doesn't matter. Right. So inclusion is the word. And that's where you value people for where they come from. You got to have a seat at the table, a voice. The leader has to create a psychologically safe environment so each person is comfortable coming forward. That's how you get high performance. I 100% agree. And even our inclusion and diversity event that we just did, we made sure that even though it was around International Women's Day, we did not want it to be branded as a woman's event. And the two speakers that we had, we had one speaker who escaped Vietnam and some very horrific conditions to migrate to Canada and become an, an officer. And then the other is a gentleman who has never been in the military and suffered a, a horrible car accident and then um, has been paralyzed for life since. And it was amazing to have such a multicultural audience of, you know, 26 maritime nations uh, that consist, you know, make up NATO to, to hear these kinds of talks. And I do believe that that is, that is the, the, the future of heart-centered leadership is getting those people on board with the idea that you aren't gonna just be able to direct them what to do and they're going to do it. They'll never respect you that way. But if you do what you're doing, they will. And then this goes now into, well, where were you born and raised? And what was it in your childhood that fostered this type of mentality? Yeah. Um, what a great question. In fact, in the book, which is right over my, uh, let's see, that's right shoulder. Yeah. I'll, put the, I'll put the back on full screen so people can see. Yeah. <laughs> yep, right there. Uh, thanks. Um, I start with emotional drivers. Each human being has emotional drivers that that start from from the the moment that they're born and and your life the way you grow is influenced by the environment you're in the experiences that you then put forth moving forward and and what is driving you from the beginning so i was born in quantico virginia my father was a marine um and um he was a quintessential marine so the standard to reach was always very high uh, in fact, as I relate in the book, he didn't tell me he was proud of me until I was a 42 year old commanding officer of a supply ship. Hmm. Uh, and and it, but when he did, it was extremely powerful. I mean, it was real. you know, getting that affirmation was really good. So I was always trying to reach that that point. My mom, my mom was like, I'm the best thing since sliced bread. I'm the oldest son of two. I am. A, I am like, you know. Some kind of deity. Nothing right. I can do is wrong. I mean, you know, so so. So those two things propelled me forward and, and like like two engines on a jet. And so if I had a, now, the cool thing is, and this is what really um, I, th I think drives me. If I had listened to my dad, I would have been rolled up in a ball, all curled up, never good enough, you know, to do anything. Right. And by the way, that is that is the foundation of my imposter syndrome. I've, I've had imposter syndrome for almost my whole life when I got to take command of Nimitz was literally talking to a coach and I told the coach, I don't think I'm good enough to do this. Right. You know, I don't know why I got selected. So it's, it's, it's kind of that piece. And then of course, if I listened to my mom, 
we have an ego the size of the room, you know, wouldn't be able to get through the door. So I always got like buoyed up by her. And then my dad's like, no, you're not any good. I'm going to try to make you better. So these two things give me this interesting combination of humility and ego. I mean, if you take that, you know, you take That's that. Fascinating. Bio, yeah. You take that bio and you go, look, a Top Gun guy, fighter pilot, went to the Naval Academy, commanded an aircraft carrier, you know, all those things are like, look, at, wow. Mm -hmm. getting the journey to get there was really windy and full of failure. That book is full of failure. It's full of resilience and failure and North stars. And we can talk about that all kind of thing. But my upbringing um, really shaped, obviously shaped how I am, but the two, the difference in my parents, and I would say to your listeners and to the readers of the book out there, people that think about this, the emotional drivers you grow up with are going to determine what kind of a leader you are. And so I have always found that I need to prove to people that that I'm good enough to be here as the boss. Mm -hmm. And the way that I do it is I prove to people I'm human like they are. And I used to, in the latter part of my career in the Navy, I would gather up all the, like the prospective leaders, like the prospective XOs, prospective CEOs, the, the people that were going to, you know, have, you know, they're on their way to being CAGs and carrier commanding officers. And I get them in a room, close the door and go, okay, what questions do you have? That's why the title of the book is Learn How to Lead to Win, because starting when, uh, and I relate this, when I was just about to take command of VF-31 in 1997, I'm literally at the bar in NAS Oceana sitting there with somebody, and it literally dawns on me, why is morale important? Why is morale important? You just order people to do the job, right? So why, why is it important that there's high morale and people are motivated to do better. And it is just like, huh, huh. So then I thought, I've got to make sure I've got the highest morale possible on my team because we need to do really good. And I'm going to be right. responsible for doing really good. But it isn't because I'm like the leader and I'm this great guy or that mm -hmm. I have all of the things to be the great guy because the, the high performance of the team is the team's performance, not the leader. And so I started from that position uh, about 18 years into my career, so halfway through, thinking about how do I teach people how to be a leader leading from the heart and not with your title? Um, there's probably some something in my psychology, like I, I, I want to be liked or something like that, you know, that, that causes me to try to, you know, get fairly, you know, closer to people than my title that I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, I don't want to be up there on a pedestal somewhere. I don't like that. Yep. Um, so, so I think that's where it came from. Um, so I don't, I don't have an ego that says I'm an admiral. Call me admiral, unless I get pissed at somebody and I go, "Hey, call me admiral," you know, just because I'm trying to make a point. But, but I don't. I, I think it. I think if you run around with your title, and you talk about, you know, "Hey, look at me," um, people are going to assume certain things about you, and and they won't perform. Let's flip that for a second. I value being approachable, and so. Leaders at a very high level, whether you're a CEO of a company, a three or a four star admiral, people expect that you are not approachable. So when I was the captain of Nimitz, it was so funny when we yeah, had beach picnics and stuff like that, you know, we'd have some, hey, there's a captain. Hey, captain, can you take a picture of you? It's like a zoo animal, right? I'm going to take a picture with a giraffe. You know, there's the captain. Hey, captain, can we, can we like take a picture? Admiral, oh my God, there's the admiral. So when you are approachable as a very senior person in your organization, you have a magnification of the power that you actually have because people go, that guy, he cares about me and he's approachable. And I feel like I'm part of the organization because he knows who I am. And you get this magnifying effect that comes from that connection to human. We feel safer. We do. Um, versus a leader that we, we might be looking at going, I don't know if they might, man, I think they might be mad at me. What did I do? And then you start thinking about it and psychological safety starts coming out and you start backing off going and you're convincing yourself of the negative, which we humans do, that the boss doesn't like me. He doesn't like my work. I, I said something the other day. God, I probably didn't tone it right. And you talk yourself into this complete, you know, mm -hmm. gross situation where where uh, if, if the leader's approachable and you come up and just drop your, your hand on somebody's shoulder, they don't even know that you know what kind of work they do. And you call them my name and you say, you know, the thing you did the other day, epic. And then and they, and they walk, you walk away and they're shaking like, what? he even knows what I work, you know. And so anyway, I, I talk about that a lot in the book. 
knowing people's names and then recognizing their work. And, th and then they go, OK, I, I feel like I'm part of the organization because the person in charge of the organization, therefore, everybody in between me and that person knows what I do. I'm valued. Thank you very much. I love being here. That's it. And, and, and the environment could be awful outside. But inside. They feel safe and they feel valued and they feel connected. And that comes from a leader who is able to connect from the heart and not not with the title. They know the title's there. They know it's there. Mm -hmm. And so you don't have to run around going, I am the fill in the blank because they know who you are. So tell them, show them who you are from the inside. How do you recommend, because you've had a lot of maintainers working for you who have not had maybe a very supportive upbringing, let's say, and they may have trust issues, let's say, and you want to bring that person up knowing that they didn't really get what they needed growing up. And now they're in a position where they're expected to lead, but they have all this baggage that they really haven't worked through or processed. And it could be very obvious I'm talking about myself as I came up through the, the ranks. Um, but what would be your advice on, on how they can learn how to lead when they really didn't get that foundation as a child. I have found Teresa, uh, especially in my experience, starting from being the executive officer of Carl Vinson back in starting in 2001, that people join the military in order to provide structure in their life. They are looking for the structure. And a lot of times they don't have the number of people is in the majority. Right. The majority is, is what I'm talking about, uh, I believe. Is, ha, you know, have challenges in their upbringing and, and learning about that sometimes just shocks you. You go, wow. And, they're, and, I, and the, the, the most shocked I got was I, I would have this phenomenal sailor. I mean, knock it out of the park, sailor of the minute, every mm -hmm. minute of the year, you know, kind of thing. And then start talking to them and learn about their upbringing, what they survived to come in here. So that's what they're expecting. Whether they are joining the U.S. military or that they're joining your company, if you know somebody and you understand they come from a very challenged background, you need to fill in as that surrogate leader, father, mother. Mentor, when I was CEO, mm -hmm. Yes. And they're, and, and, and they're looking for that emotionally. When I was CEO of the Nimitz, I found myself acting like that innumerable mm -hmm. times. I filled that role um, in the in captain's mast. Um, I would often, you know, I would, I would talk to the chain of command and I would I'd go, OK, what do we got here? And sometimes they'd go, hey, boss, you need to kick this this person out of the Navy. You know, they're just blah, blah. I said, no, this is the first time I've seen him. I'm not kicking him out because I haven't seen him yet. Or it would be like, all right, hey, boss, tough, tough, individual, you know, tough background, learning, working hard, just can't quite get it. Just give them a talking to, you know, and so, so putting yourself as a leader in understanding where your people come from and assuming that that role as a surrogate parent could be very, very important. Um, we all, I think, relay the stories we have when we grow up and there's a, there's a leader or a mentor who has a particularly powerful impact on your life and you're connected to that person. Uh, part of the mentorship piece is you are emotionally connected to to a strong mentor. And I have heard innumerable stories about people that said, I didn't have a father. And this person took that father role and I could confide in them. Or I didn't have a mother or I didn't have a role model growing up or I was in foster care. Mm -hmm. um, I'm doing some work with a with a, a charity called uh, International Student uh, Federation. And we. The, the organization takes kids at 18 years old out of foster care and helps them with scholarship and leadership to live. Because in the United States, you, when, when you hit 18 years old, you're, you're out in the, in the world. They don't, there's mm -hmm. no care beyond 18 years old in the foster families. And the stories of these kids are heart shattering. And so the ability to be a leader and again, connecting from the heart, if you know your people, and you can sense that there's something that's, that's driving them. You can dive into that a little bit and then give them a path, give them a mentorship, mm -hmm. um, you know, backboard and stuff. And, and the answer to your question, it's really easy 
to drop into that role if you're thinking about it from your heart and you're you're striving to know people and you're curious and interested where they come from and what drives them and you'll find phenomenal stories of survival and and um you know yearning um you know when people my experience got in the u.s navy from backgrounds like that you know their drive to succeed was so strong and they they just want you know want to be afforded the opportunity to you know to advance and stuff and in a military organization there are lots of opportunities to do that that's the great thing about the u.s military in any service a little bit harder in a company when somebody you know from a different background joins a company because typical companies don't have military structure unless they have a lot of veterans serving in the company who kind of have that background right and i think even as a even in a civilian company too there just isn't as much time i mean when we are deployed at sea and around each other all of the time you you can see the sides to people that sometimes don't that sometimes are not readily apparent day to day if you're only going in during a, a standard working hours. And even now with so many corporations that are doing work from home, I think that ability to connect face to face in that more meaningful way is even that much more challenged because of the times that we live in. You bring up a wonderful point. Um, I talk about this all the time. You have to connect with people and COVID made it better from a technology perspective to, to be productive, but really bad from a human connection capability. Uh, that's agree. why the statistics of loneliness and suicide and psychological problems, anxiety, depression have gone it's, through it's the skyrocketed. roof. Yep. Skyrocketed. Yep. Gone through the roof now because of that, that disconnection. So we've got to work extra hard as leaders to pull everybody back together in however way you can. And you'll have to overcome the habit that people have of, and you can see my background. I'm working from home this morning. Right. Uh, didn't go into work. And so, you know, it's comfortable. Dog's right over there. You know, I've got a cup of coffee here. I'm, I'm not in a suit and tie like I normally am in, in my day job. And it's like, look, I, I, I'm good here. Yep. But, Everybody, I think, wants that opportunity to work from home, too. Yeah. And I can't underestimate how important it is as a leader uh, to give them that. I sometimes I have a love hate relationship with it as, as a boss, because when the front office wants something and I only have two people or one person in the office, it, it is it is very aggravating. But then at the same time, it's this thing I know I can give people to lessen the burden of the constant nonstop traffic jam that that occurs in my office day to day. So uh, I I. I know it's necessary and is, and, is, and is a new incentive for leaders to to inspire work and production, but it 100%. makes them lose that connection. <laughs> I agree. It's the new way of working, but leaders have to understand what you are losing when you allow people to just be at home all the time, which which is really good. I love it. I'm, I'm, I'm telling you, I love it. You lose the connection and people go, well, we need to be connected here because we'll get better. Maybe, I don't know, water cooler talk. I don't know. I am more productive at home, as I'm sure you are, than I am I at am. work because people come and lean on the door and yes. talk to you and distract you. And there's things that yes. distract you. So you're focused, right? And we tend to work a lot of long hours. But psychologically, we are alone. Some people get very lonely and they lose the connection to, you know, to the organization. And if you've established a heartfelt connection with people and, and a leadership uh, kind of a mantra from the heart, you will lose that if you're not if you're not connected with each other. So that that's all I'm saying is is that that makes it a little harder. It does. It does. But I think that like you said there's ways to overcome it. There's ways to use a hybrid approach, which I think a lot of companies and, and workplaces are doing mm -hmm. to overcome that. But uh, from your perspective, you could have gotten out of the military after all these accomplishments, gone into Boeing, became a VP and not even gone down this road of coaching and leadership. What made you decide to create this whole, basically second job of, of writing these books and, and, and having the website and doing these things? What was it that made you say, okay, I, I want to do more? Teresa, interesting journey. Um, so when I joined Boeing, they had a they had a program called Leaders Teaching Leaders. And what they would do in, in a place called the Boeing Leadership Center in St. Louis, Missouri, 
is they would have vice presidents come in and and talk to large groups of up and coming leaders and managers who were training to do things. And we would come in and talk for an hour, an hour and a half on on topics, you know, crisis communication, crisis leadership, leading in crisis, uh, you know, a whole bunch of topics. And I loved going there. I loved it. And and I, you know, I went four times a year, once a quarter and whatever class was there, I talked about the same stuff. I had like 10 things that I think are are really important. Actually, they're they're in they're in the book, you know, 10 maxims that I think are important. So I would roll them into a, a brief. And it was really funny because the organizer was like, hey, uh, we don't want slides. You know, can you just talk? I said, hey, I got this. I've got this. And so for four years, once a quarter, so think 16 times, I also facilitated some leadership uh, conversations and stuff, uh, large seminars. But Teresa, every time somebody asked me a question out of all of those interactions, so thousands of people, I not only had an answer from my Navy experience, I had a story. I mean, I literally, hey, let me tell you about that one time I this happened to me. It was shocking to me. Every question, I had a story. And I'm not saying, you know, I had answers to all of the things, but the, my experiences is in the U.S. Navy had given me all of these these things that I learned and messed with and failed and, and bumped my knee and fell down and got up and succeeded and didn't succeed and how I dealt with it and the resilience and stuff. Every question was a story that started me thinking, you know, and so the, the catalyst, the catalyst to the book. Yeah. Over there. I can't, I can't do the camera thing over there. Right, the the catalyst to the book yep. and the website and everything was my mentor, current mentor, business partner. His name is Ben Carroll. He's actually the founder of that ISF uh, charity that I talked to you about. Uh, he's a businessman in Dallas. Um, he is the leader of the of the company that does our family office investments. And so I was down there in February of 2022 and uh, doing an in-person meeting. And I believe that God is guiding my life. I just do. And I'm, 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 I'm not overly religious, but people that land on carriers at night are not atheists. Trust me. And so... <laughs> I decided I was going to have an in-person meeting down in Dallas with a group of people. And Ben was at the table and he said, Mike, you ought to write a book because I told a story. And I go, I got no time. And he says, of course. that's what you always say. Yeah, yeah, I've got no time to do it. And he goes, oh, it's easy. You get some of that transcription software on your computer, you know, and like it's the one called Dragon or something. Talk into a microphone, gives you a Word document, transcript, a couple hours every, you know, a couple weekends in a row. There you go. I go, okay, cool. Really, thanks. And he goes, and I'll help you. Really? So two weeks later, he calls me and he says, hey, Mike, book. And I said, you're serious? And he goes, yeah. So I went down to Dallas in April of 2022, and I talked into a microphone. Half the day, half the day I worked down there, one of the offices down there, and, and the other half the day I took off and I went to his office, which was literally 20 minutes away, another God-given coincidence. And I talked for four to six hours a day for five days in a microphone. Wow. Ooh. And I just told the stories because, you know, what, you know what happened? He says, you have homework on the phone call. You need to write down 20 leadership things that you have a story for. Teresa, I wrote 45 in less than 15 minutes. Boom, 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 boom. Burned into the synapses of my brain. Would you just put like bullets of like the stories yeah. that you wanted yeah. to? Okay. And yeah. then you knew what the stories were going to be. Yeah. Yeah. And mm -hmm. they were like, how do you remember that? I remember every detail of you the do. things. That... I've read, I'm on chapter four right now. Uh, yeah. And I got a little bit sidetracked because of Sweden. But um, <laughs> you do remember so many. Uh, I details. remember all the details. I don't know why. They're just in there. And I know what I learned. And so I just wrote one liners. And, mm -hmm. and I had years before when I was still in the Navy, uh, like 2016-ish, I tried to write the ejection story. Uh, there is, yeah, I, I ejected mm -hmm. it's, it's past chapter four, I think. Uh, I, I tried you to write it on the Wombach channel. Oh, no, no, you shared Wombach shared, shared. I watched that podcast where he shared about the other gentleman who, who ejected yeah. the guy who almost died. <laughs> that was insane. Yeah, that was really insane. I tried writing that story down with my hand, like a pencil. Mm -hmm. It took me like four hours to get half a page. It was like, I, and I quit. I don't, I don't do journals. I don't do, I don't do that. Right. Do. That's the reason why I have never written a book. People tell me the same thing. And I say, there's no way I, I can't remember details and I can't think to myself to write it out, but I yeah. never thought about talking it out. So 
so I just told the stories and we got this thing here and then we went through the, um, you know, the, the editing process. And what I would do is I would do the writing and the, and the chopping and everything. Ben would do the technical stuff. He found us, he found us an editor, Sandy Wendell, who is on LinkedIn. She's great. Um, we got a checklist from a guy named Dave Chesson and Kindle Preneur. We self publish on Amazon. It works great. If you have cover art and a PDF, you can publish anything on Amazon, you know, <laughs> Mike's Mike's <laughs> summer vacation, you know, what I did on my summer vacation by Mike. And you can no kidding. And it works, it works awesome. So he kind of does the technical checklist stuff. And then he is a wonderful, wonderful man, mentor, thinker. He's a deacon uh in a church. He thinks about these things. And so I would have a great story, and then I would tell my leadership lesson like to him, and he would go, Well, what did it smell like? What did it taste like? How did they react? What right. what was what was the smell? And so we did a bunch of show, not tell with a leadership lesson and put a lot of, you know, thickness in it. And then I wrote the whole thing in my voice um, and then also narrate an audio book, which was interesting. Um, so I, I, I narrate my own book and and read those stories. But I have been telling stories and I love to tell stories. They're fun stories. So it's easy for me to just talk tell the story and then relate what I, what I learned that then got into, well, you know, you need to go around and talk and tell stories. And so that's what I do. And we do, um, you know, we, we got, we got a hundred discrete topics. We're at, we're at number 50. That's the free newsletter a week. And we write a newsletter, Ben and I put it together and then send it out to everybody that signs up and, and it just mm-hmm. is burgeoned. And I think this is my thing. Um, yeah, it's on this website here. I'll just I'll put the link here oh, below. Yeah. And it's also, of course, in the show notes. And I'll even share the share my screen here here real quickly and show people also where they can see the, the website. But it really is wonderful the way that you did this. And and what you're what I'm hearing as you tell this story. And here's here's the website right here, Mike. Can you see it? Cool. Yeah, I can. Look at that. Yep, there you are. <laughs> That's my last and, flight. <laughs> That's so cool. Yeah. And and uh, what I'm hearing and what I think my listeners or, or watchers uh, ought to take away is that this is something anyone can do. They just oh. have to find the people who will help them. I, I don't think that writing a book is something that you should or or could take on by yourself. But I do think that when, with the right people and the right support system, this is this is very possible for anyone to share their story. I, I- Totally, totally agree. And I would encourage everybody who has something to say to get in some kind of public forum and say it. And, you know, um, you know, there's post social media. You can you can get out there. And and I'm not saying controversial. I'm not saying go extreme or anything, you know, be Mm -hmm. positive, be be focused on bettering people's lives or doing something like you're doing, Teresa, right here. I mean, this is the kind of thing that people can do. I am mentoring directly three people who want to write their own books. And I'm I'm just telling them what I did. And I just I just told told your audience right there, get the transcription software. And I think Word 11 on Microsoft actually has a dictate up in the right hand corner. I don't have it. I use the other stuff, but I, somebody told me one of the, one of the guys who's writing a book says up here in the co- right hand corner of word 11, there's a little microphone. You can dictate into your microphone and it'll, it'll write it. So it's easy. If you find it difficult to write it down, you can talk and it creates a manuscript quickly at the speed of your voice. You can watch it. Hmm. You can say, no, 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 no. It's gobbledygook. Delete that. Or you do a line and, and you got something you can chop on. So it gives you something to start. And then, like I said, self-publishing with Dave Chesson on Kindlepreneur. It's probably a free advertisement for him, but I use it. I tell people use that. And it it describes you the checklist item to self-publish. And you don't have to go to a publisher. You don't have to worry through all of that. You own the rights to your books or your materials. It's it works great. And what is your advice for people who say, and I hear this a lot about even my social media platforms? Oh, it's self-promotion. It's all about you. Why should I write a book and share these stories about me? What would you say to those people who, who, who say that? People are interested in you. And I, I, I have the same thing. You know, when we first 
I look at the reviews pretty closely. You know, you have to have a thick skin. We're doing pretty well. I mean, I have a 4.9 something average. I don't get very many like you suck kind of, you know, <laughs> reviews. <laughs> but I did get a couple like, well, here's another retired admiral writing a book. You know, OK, OK. You know, yeah, I'll take there's, it. We've sold, you know, there's about 1,300 audio books and about 65 or 6,600 um, hard copies. People resonate with the book, the material. And so I think that my experiences can help other people. The comments back to me are that my experiences are helping them work through some things. And so, you know, if I can share that and and I can right. tell stories that help people out, I think I think it's fine. But yeah, sometimes every once in a while, like, well, who are you? Especially the speaking thing. I'll tell you what really... I speak for money, Teresa, because my my time is valuable. Trying to come up with my value is impossible. Oh, it's oh, I'm sure because it, you think that if you go too high, it's like who do it's like the imposter yeah. syndrome probably comes in. Like who, oh, yeah. who do I think I am charging this much? And you go too low, and you're like, well, no, my my time is valuable, and I have a lot of things that I need to do. And if I'm going to do this, I I would like to be compensated for it because yep. it shows your own value in in yourself. I think that also some of the things that I hear a lot, and, and I see this with a lot of the active duty uh, social media influencers, the ones who are much younger than myself. I mean, I, I get crap for what I do because I, I do talk about controversial issues. And I don't talk about controversial issues for the sake of sparking controversy. I talk about them because I believe that the only way we solve problems is, is to shine a light on them and to work through what the solutions should be. And so I have people on my show who are advocates in Congress, going to hearings, calling their legislators. And I'm trying to show that there is a way to do this and to bring about change. But by being this way, um, and even with some of the active duty younger influencers, they're they, they going to get a lot of flack from people who really, quite frankly, sometimes I feel are just not in the arena. And it's easy to throw those stones from the sidelines. But what would be your advice to them? Because I, I hear it all the time from especially the Instagram influencers, some of the some of the females, um, they get a lot of crap for what they do. And I know that it can sometimes really hurt them. And I try my best to encourage them. I mean, we all feel like we're, we're, and I told you this before the call, we feel like we are the future, uh, the way that we communicate. And I think that the world will catch up to us. But until that happens, uh, we're, we're going to catch a little bit of crap for what we're doing. And, and what would you say to, to try to encourage them? Um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, I'm not going to tell you keep going because you're already the energy to do that. So that's easy. First rule, be aware of your surroundings. If you're going to dive into the arena and you're going to, you know, throw a spear at the emperor up there in the first row, be careful because, mm -hmm. you know, you're right there. So you have to understand that. Second, people who are part of organizations. So as a U.S. Navy admiral, you know, once I became a lieutenant commander in the Navy, I lost my ability to be a junior officer, say anything I wanted to anybody. Right. Sure. I became mm -hmm. a manager. Um, and so you have to be aware of the fact that I'll do this in my example. I had to be aware of the fact that the headline is U.S. Navy captain, U.S. Navy admiral, not Mike Manazer. So anybody who is wearing a uniform invites controversy if they're talking about things because the pundits will label it U.S. Navy commander. Therefore, it's U.S. Navy and it will invite controversy. So you have to be aware that you can't be an individual and be part of a public organization like the military. You can't wholly be an individual. We should speak out. Everybody should have a voice, especially giving voice to the issues that are being held down inside the organizations. But you must be aware of that. In my current role, I am a vice president in a company. I can't just run around and, and say things. I am very careful about what I post and what I talk about in public because, yes, it says Mike Manazer on the bottom of that screen, but I'm a vice president for the company. I'm a retired U.S. Navy admiral. I have a professional identity that is inescapable. So I can't be a complete 
boundaries off individual. You can't. And so in order to be a very effective influencer that can use those kind of things, you just manage your messaging with the, you know, with the environment that's around you and the identity you are given. I am always aware. I have been aware because of the positions I've been in and I'm currently in. I can get above the fold in a heartbeat. And it's not going to be Mike Manazer. It's going to be the title that I have. Could be yeah. unfair, could be fair, could be not. The media is always looking for controversial news. I found when I was an admiral in the Pentagon and I would I would speak, they would only, and I would want to get a message into the papers. You know this as a PA professional. They look for controversy. So if they the do. director of air warfare says, I'm no longer buying X, I'm buying Y, boom, I am all over the defense news as a director of air warfare. If I talk about, you know, the threat and I make a controversial statement, boom, I'm all over the news. And so the news picks up controversial statements. If you are an influencer out there and you seek controversy, be careful because you'll get blown up and you'll invite critique. Yep. And so that's what I would say to people. If you're going to weigh into issues that are important to you, um, they are important to other people and the opposite is also important to even to other, other people. people. Yep. And you're going to get, you know, in large organizations that are bureaucratic, they will, they, they will, large organizations will not want to take on any risk to the organization, any reputation risk, any, public risk, any, anything like that. And so they are always going to side on the, on the, the benefit to the organization and not the benefit of the individual. Again, if you are part of an organization where you could be labeled like Admiral U S Navy, I'm retired. Now I can say things that I couldn't say as an active duty Admiral, but I'm in a company as a vice president and I'm expected to hold a certain decorum of, of, uh, of, of attitude and perform, uh, what do you call it? Uh, whatever out in the public space. And I do um, the things that I talk about in leadership, I think will benefit any leader anywhere. And it's talking about human connection and positive stuff, but I will very much measure what I weigh into. And there are things that I won't weigh into because of the controversies associated when the media grabs a hold of something and then expands it like that. So that's what right. I would say to influencers, just be careful what you're trying to influence and don't be surprised if you invite controversy down on your head and then direct individual identification of you as an influencer, both positive and negative and negative and negative. Um, and most of the stuff out there these days, especially with the anonymity of social media is negative. And so you kind of have to expect that when you're in the arena. I, I think that it's a balance because I think that while you are always representing the organization at all times. I also think that as you do this online, and I see it not only with myself, but with other influencers, you start to see patterns in certain things that you want to change. And if you can go to a place where you are advocating for a policy change in a way that is respectful to the organization and isn't directly in alignment with the current chain of command that you're in, I do believe, and this is just my, this is my personal feelings, that I do believe that there is space to respectfully um, advocate for those policies, especially because as we know, most policies in the military are not controlled by the military, they're controlled by Congress. And I think that everyone in a, in a free country and in a democracy should have the ability to do that in a way that doesn't disrespect the very organizations that they're working to try to make change from within. That, that, is, that is just my opinion, but I know that there's other people that see this differently. And I respect the people on the other side of the coin that see this differently than myself. But one thing that's been wonderful about being at NATO is that I'm able to see how all these other countries and organizations who, who do want democracy and they do want freedom of speech how they can do that in a way that really just shows the love of the organization. Um, th that, that is what I've found to work for me. It, it is not always uh, easy and it's not the, 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 
the the road that I know of many people go down, but I believe that in the end it, it is the road that will lead to 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 a good path ultimately later on down the road. It it may, it may not, but I, I do believe that it, it is the right thing to do. Do you think that there are people who uh talk about their story in a way that they can just inspire change and inspire growth? Or do you think that there are people that that, that go too far? Well, there's both. By the way, I'm reminded, I wrote a couple articles for Proceedings Magazine published by the U.S. Naval Institute, uh, and they always invite, and they have for over 100 years, invited commentary inside their covers against, you know, kind of what the normal mm -hmm. the Navy, they value that independent thought. And they, they talk about that all the time because that kind of debate can incite change. Um, respectful is, is a great idea. I don't support anybody attacking another person or an institution. Mm -hmm. Don't attack. Yep. Um, you invite counterattack and it's not good. Um, and so highlighting an issue, highlighting why you think it's important and you're focused on making an organization better um, is where you should be. Um, the difficulty sometimes, and, and that's why, you know, our Republic and our nation and our debate has always worked because we, we are able to give voice to stuff, but unfortunately we've, we've resorted to attacking and everybody attacks. And so if you're an influencer out there, don't attack, don't attack, just, you know, get the issue out there, talk as positive as you can be aware of your environment, be aware that you're going to, you know, invite, of commentary against you because that's what happens. But I would I would highlight those issues, but don't attack, and definitely don't personally attack. Yeah. Um, and I and I would say that you know there are people that do this very very well, and they are articulate and they describe a problem that that we all should think about. And there are other influencers out there that directly attack, they denigrate the opposition and do not really frame the problem in a way that invites collective debate. Uh, and again, social media magnifies all of this on all sides. And you see it, um, you know, I, I tend to stay away from the commentary to something. I just quit reading it because it's so, there's so much vitriol out there and people are attacking. If we stop attacking, we'll get to better debates. It's, it's the same as any organizational dynamic. You can be in a room if we're all in person in a conference room and somebody brings up a, a problem and then and people start shouting at each other and yelling and doing the same thing that happens on social media in person, you know how we all react. Well, the anonymity of social media, we don't we don't get to, you know, cease the conflict in the room because we're not all in the room together. So, again, going back to your previous question, if you're an influencer out there and, and you're you're willing to weigh in and jump into the arena, just just be aware of your own approach mm -hmm. and then and then be willing to take whatever comes your way um, depending on what you're bringing up right and and there are some amazing uh, ways that I think we can share leadership lessons through storytelling and ways in which we've made organizations better and I think your book is a perfect example of that because I think that everybody struggles and everyone fails. And I think that if we can have an honest conversation about that, even from our most senior leaders, I think that it will help in, 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 in engender trust. And that leads me to my next question, which is about respect and trust. What has been for you, you'd say of all the stories that you shared in the book, what do you think for you stood out as probably the one that where you really learn like the value of, of building trust among your team. Yeah. So uh, trust is foundational. And I talk about this all the time. In fact, yesterday in front of a group, I built a story about trust. I extend trust from the get go to people. I know their competence and capabilities because I've learned them. Even walking into a new team, I extend trust. Some people will not trust you until you prove you can be trusted. It'll never work. Um, if you read The Speed of Trust by Stephen M. R. Covey, it's somewhere in the bookshelves over there. It's it's a great book talking about trust. The story that I tell that's the best about trust is actually not in the book, but it's a little short ebook that's out there. 
It's called uh, uh, Trust Amplified, hmm. and it's it's uh, it, it's a little it's on Amazon. It's a little it's a little ebook. It's a story, um, and you can you can download it real quick. But basically, I jumped with the Golden Knights in 1994 as part of a job I was doing in the Pentagon, and um, and I'll, I'll just give the the punchline uh, when they opened the door for us to jump out. Um, the story is more full and it's, it's really fun to tell when they open the door, jump out at 14,000 feet down is the North Carolina countryside. My knees buckled. I was terrified. And and I've been in the, I landed on carriers for 13 years, nighttime, you know, scared out of my mind. And I was terrified, physically affected. And I looked into the eyes of one of the two Delta guys that was helping me in that free fall. And he said, he said, commander, this airplane is going to land and we're not going to be on it. We can either throw you out or you can take us out. And in that instant, my fear disappeared. The uncertainty of what that was going to feel like to just jump out of a perfectly good airplane and go 14,000 feet down to my, my certain death disappeared. That's what I talk about trust. I trusted that person because I looked in his eyes and he said, I got your back. Mm -hmm. So I tell people, You've got to take away the uncertainty from your team, which is creating the fear. And you take that away, that's trust. And you will go together forward as a high performing team because you've established trust between you and your team. So that's the story. And it's, again, it's, it's in there. It's not in the book because I didn't put it in the book, it, uh, but I did write a little short story about it. And it's, it's a great one. And no kidding. I went from petrified, terrified, no freaking way, knees buckled. I'm not kidding. Knees buckled. Never had that happen to me before to this person looking me in the eyes going, this is going to be fine. And out we went. Most fun thing I ever did. Totally. Cool. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing what can happen when you, when you put your trust in people and when they put their trust in you and it, it takes, it, it, it takes a, a very strong person to, to do that. But because I think that again, if you've not been raised in a trusting environment, I think sometimes it's very difficult to, to build that. But at, when you do build it, it's such an amazing feeling. And I think one of the things that you said in the book that really resonated with me too, is that you come in away with the assumption that it's going to get done right. And, and you, you, you start with that in your head that it's going to get done. You might have to ask, and you said this in the book, you might have to ask a few questions along the way about how things are coming along. But if you just put your faith that it's going to work out, it, well, it usually finds a way of working out. Yeah. You know, it's it's not faith it's going to work out because, you know, it's funny. When I trained in nuclear power, uh, in Navy nuclear power, we were trained to ask why five times. Literally, why, why? Like a kid, you know, who says, mm -hmm. why, why, why? And you get down mm -hmm. to this thing. So we were trained to do that. I learned how in Navy nuclear power to ask questions to people and determine that they actually didn't know what they were doing or that they were on track. One of the two. So as a leader, you kind of know you get first of all, you give them the why. This is why we're going to go do that. And this is what we're going to go do. But they get to do the how and you give them that support and, and faith and trust to say, you guys can figure this out. I trust you. You have the skills. Go. And then every once in a while you check in and you ask a question like, hey, how's, how's it going right now? Oh, it's good, sir. Yeah, we're good. We're good. OK, did you get approval for this thing? Huh? Uh, well, we got a meeting next week and you, you can you can start to tell. When people are on track, mm -hmm. especially when the team leaders come to you every once in a while and they go, hey, boss, want to give you an update on what you're doing? Da -da -da, da -da 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 -da. OK, you need any help? Nope, no. Nope, all good. Be back next week. Boom. And, and you kind of get this feeling that they're moving along. Mm -hmm. So it's not. And, and the speed of trust by Covey talks about this naive trust. It's it's silly things like you own a high end car. You, you have a brand new Maserati. Would you hand the kids or the keys to your 14 year old son? No, yeah. no, you wouldn't. I mean, there are there are things that you trust people with and you know that that's within their capabilities. Now, here's the benefit. First of all, people will feel valued when you hand them something, and you're delegating it to them. You go, here you go. I want you to get this done. They feel valued. They feel rewarded. They feel recognized, especially when they succeed. And then I mm -hmm. talk more about the target they're going to go hit. My target is an X ring. It's very small. I've been doing it. I have the experience. I can hit it hard every time. Your target for them is this big. If you're here somewhere, 
that's good. And you're helping them along and you're saying, hey, you know, so here's my experience. Here's here's how I would attack that kind of problem. Here's how I would kind of go about it. But you're very careful not to dive in and, and, and tell them what to do. And you just encourage them along the way. And, and then and then especially when they get close, you reward them, you, you talk about them, you talk about them on the general announcing system on the ship about how cool they are, what they did, you know, and, and it motivates them to try harder. And they're not going to learn until they fail. So you got to let them fail. And so yeah. that book, you know, that book right there is full of failure. And I was given an opportunity to do things my whole career. And I would fail and the leaders would go, you know, hey, what do you need to help? OK. And you have to be understanding. And so, you know, as a leader in your organization, what you can afford to fail at. Of course, you know, critical things, you know, to keep them away. When I was driving Nimitz, I gave the ship to the conning officer. And you know this, Teresa. So there's a junior officer, conning officer, and they're petrified. They're over there and they, they can't <laughs> barely get out the word yeah, left 10 are. degrees rudder. <laughs> There's a lieutenant officer of the deck over the top of them who has qualifies off their deck so can drive the ship. And I'd sit over in the chair and we'd go out to San Diego Harbor or some other harbor, you know, and, and it looked awful. I mean, it, if you track the ship, it's doing all these weird things. I just sit there and watch them and I had the limits. OK, so fail. What's fail for them? I need you to stay on track. Hey, you're coming off track. Fail that we can't is the ship hits the rocks. And so I had my boundaries for. Yep. The failure can't hit the rocks, can't come close, can't get into an extremist situation. So my definition of their failure was completely different than my definition of the organizational failure, which was grounding the ship. But I'd right. let them drive around. And if they didn't see the deviation, I use this metaphor all the time. If they didn't see the deviation and allow me to go, do you see what happened there? They would never know what to do about it. As if I said, if I started giving orders, hey, left some more rudder. Every once in a while, I'd just say, you might want a little more rudder. Are you going a little fast? You know, and they would, you know, the OD would whisper something and the, and the junior officer would give the right order. And I might say maybe a little more, you know, maybe all back full, you know, and, 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 you know, just suggest things so they could see the error. And then the debrief later on is what's most important. And mm -hmm. in a company, you can do exactly the same thing. You can, you can see where the track is. You have, you have periodic updates You'll know when they're not on track, just like driving a ship along the course line. You'll know when the ship is off course. Most important is when it's off course and heading further off course, you need to help them come back in. But allow them to see they're off course and then ask them, what do you recommend you do to get back on course? And you can right. hand them that thing. How do we get back to where we're going to go? Because plans are nothing. Planning's everything. Eisenhower said that. You contact with the enemy, contact with the environment, contact with the adversary, contact with something is going to change the plan. So you're going to you're you're not always going to be on course. So right. how you get back is a real talent of organizations. Yeah, it, it is. And uh, I think that as you grow as a leader, or as I've grown as a leader, I've been able to allow myself to be OK with a certain level of failure or not being on track because of the fact that I know that if I just take over and do it, it, it isn't going to help that person learn how to fix that problem. And that leads to some, one of my, uh, cause I know we're kind of to coming towards the top of the hour and we are at the top of the hour, but the idea of how much does a leader do versus how much does a leader lead? And what I mean by that is that I've always respected my leaders who do. And, and I know that you were that way, even when you were on Nimitz, you were still flying and, and, and you did all kinds of crazy maneuvers and flybys and things like that. And so you were a doer as well as a leader. And I want to know what that impact has and when you know to do versus when you know to lead. Yeah. You know, that's a real balance. Um, first of all, you know, getting to fly off your own ship is epic. The, the the captain of an aircraft carrier is the best job in the galaxy. The flight deck is my happy place. I love it. I used to love going out. I'd give the ship to the XO or the navigator and I go out on the flight deck, put my float coat on and my, my cranial and stuff. I have a mouse and I just go wander around the flight deck, just standing up there in the crotch or 
watching flight ops. I knew exactly where I needed to be. You know, I, I got to pal around with the yellow shirts. I would go down to flight deck control, have a cup of coffee. They had a, you know, hey, Captain, you want your coffee? Yes, yeah, sir. And I did the same thing at Admiral on Dwight D. Eisenhower. I would go hang out at flight deck control because I loved being there. I just loved being part of the team. And so I would wander down and hang out and go out on the flight deck. I'd go out at night. Um, I'd stand out there at night and, you know, and I'd power on the flight deck bosuns and, you know, they knew, they knew where I was, make sure the captain was okay, make sure the admiral was okay. Um, and I, I, I demonstrated that, that I was still part of the organization, you know, and, and of course flying. Um, I watched my role models when I grew up in the U S Navy, the admirals and the captains who were in the jet. And it was just so neat, you know, to, mm -hmm to see that person in there, even behind the helmet and the mask and stuff and go, Hey, that's the, that's the boss. You know, the boss is making it happen out here. And, and, you know, the way that I flew the airplane uh, challenging the junior officers with, you know, yanking G's around a ship and doing stuff. And, you know, it was, it was, it was really fun. And I think that leaders, you, you will, you will know the balance that's comfortable for you. Um, showing your team that you're willing to do stuff. The, the stories I love the best is, and you have to, you have to remember that you're a, you serve the team that you're leading. You're, you're, you serve the term, you're the team you're leading. So I would run down as a captain, mostly as an XO because I had more time. I'd go down to the galley, put an apron on, put a hat on, serve food, tell the sailors they had to have more of the green stuff and less of the Mac and cheese, you know, and I just hooting and hollering and, you know, go down there um, if I see something, if there's a piece of trash on the floor, I'm going to I'm going to reach down and I'm going to pick it up. Um, if there is somebody struggling with something, you're on a, you on a, I mean, it's this is an easy one. You're on an airplane and somebody's struggling to lift a piece of luggage, pick up the piece of luggage, put it in. Doesn't matter who you are. Um, walk around, pick up trash, you know, join the FOD walk downs that are out there. I think leaders will understand how much to weigh in and connect. And boy, I'll tell you what, when you're doing that, you learn a lot. So. <laughs> yeah. I would fly and go out on the flight deck and hang out and do all those things down and in because I could learn a whole bunch of stuff. You know, people would talk to me. I'd run around the ship. People would talk to me. They'd tell me stuff. You know, we have legends about Seaman Timmy telling the captain something that then reverberates through the chain of command and like, oh, my God, Seaman Timmy, you know, and uh, <laughs> and and so leaders will find if you, you walk in the, the manufacturing floor. You know, if you're down there and you participate in one of the meetings, you just drop in on somebody's meeting. You're going to see how the manager's talking. You're going to see what questions are coming up. You're going to see what the attitudes are. You're going to see what the briefing is. You can give a quick, hey, words from the boss. You know, be careful out there. You know, we're focused on safety or something like that. Good. And then you walk away. I mean, it's like, holy shit, that was the boss. I mean, he, <laughs> sorry about that. He He's, wow. Okay. And you, yeah. you learn a lot and you're connected, right? And so I would... I would say that each leader has a balance of what they know to do. Whatever it is, though, do not stay in your office. Get out. Go do something. If you hear that there's a company BRG, you know, a resource group meeting somewhere, go to it. If there's a weekend, you know, a, a small unit of your organization weekend picnic, go to it. Um, you know, go spend time. Don't be mm -hmm. afraid. Um, get down and in with everybody and start to mingle again from a human perspective. Put yourself out there and, and, and get out and do and lead and you will find your leadership will improve and increase if you do more doing than, you know, sitting up somewhere writing, writing emails. Writing emails. Right. Yeah. No, yep. I totally agree. Oh, gosh, Mike, I feel like we could just talk forever. I really do. <laughs> this has been so enjoyable. I, I, I really get a lot out of this. And I think that I hope that anyway, I hope our, our listeners and the audience will too. Um, if you could say anything to sort of close this out and, and to say what you would say are the top three things, I think you have three C's that you want people to keep in mind. Oh boy. When, do you, I think it was in the book. It was something yeah. calm was one of them. And then I cooked a couple others. Can you, can you touch upon that? Well, the C's, you know, calm, confident, competent, you know, if you're yes. calm all the time, you're confident in what you're doing and the, and the people know you're confident. Um, that's, that's key. Uh, I want to do something else. Authenticity. Number one, be who you are. Um, people will comment to me, you know, man, you're the one thing I know about you is you're authentic. 
you're going to say, and Teresa, you're really good at bringing up things and, and saying stuff and not be afraid to get in the arena. Well, me too. I tend to <laughs> fill the vacuum and I will come out. Authenticity, 100%. Do not act. Anything you do has to be your authentic self. That's first. Second, vulnerability. Be willing to admit your faults. That book is full of vulnerability, is full yes. of failures. People learn and respect they learn more and respect you more if you are willing to tell them, I put my pants on one leg at a time, just like you. That biography you read at the very beginning of our time together, if you stack that up, wow, look at that. The path to get there, oh my God. I mean, just failure after failure, keep trying, keep trying. And then the third one is have a North Star. Have a North Star in your life. What are you trying to achieve? Yeah, what do you, what do you want? Yep. The, the, when you get up in the morning, what's my North Star for today? But I have always had a North Star for, you know, kind of out there. It's a long vision. So in the beginning of the book, I went to the U.S. Naval Academy so I could go fly. That mm -hmm. honed to, I'm going to fly Tomcats off carriers. And I got to do that. Then it was, I'm, you know, my North Star then was, you know, kind of to, to do the best I could in the Navy. Mm -hmm. The North Star comes to you sometimes from different places. So as related in the book, my dad took us to a Georgia Tech Navy football game when we were stationed at Marine Corps Air Station, Beaufort, South Carolina in like 1974. I was in eighth grade. He had told stories about the Naval Academy. He was a graduate and, you know, my whole young life and didn't make any difference to me. They were just interesting stories. Watch the midshipmen marched on, march on and I went bang that right there. Black coat, white hat. I'm one of those people right there, right then. That was the flash. That was the vision. And it became from that day, that Saturday in 1974 ish. I was going to the Naval Academy and that started my journey. It was a flash. That was what I was meant to do. Something is going to give you a North Star. Seek it out. Go after it. Be authentic on the way. Enjoy the journey. Be willing to fail. Get in the arena. And you, when you get up from failure, the more the more failure you do, the more resilient you'll be, the better you'll be. But what's very interesting to me, especially this late in my life, every time I failed and gotten up and looked at the backside of the failure, I go, oh, that's why this happened. Yeah. And I've got lots yeah. of stories about that. And, there, and a lot of them are in the book. But the recognition that that failure was supposed to happen to you so you could learn something is hard. It's a hard rule. And so people that hang back and don't want to go because they're afraid of failure, you're missing the opportunity to have a better life and to do better in your life. And good things happen to people who keep trying. Failure only happens. Right. Failure only happens when you quit trying. When you quit. So true. So you know true. What? Time is not a factor. If you had a goal to be X, by the end of 2023, it's okay. You didn't make it, but you still got a North Star. And all right, now you got a new plan for 2024. It's okay. Mm -hmm. Maybe you meant to write that book in 23 and you didn't do it. Okay, 24. Okay, it's 32 and you finally wrote that book. Well, look at that. You wrote the book. Time doesn't matter. Have a North Star. Keep trending to the North Star. You'll have a wonderful life. I love it. Absolutely love it. Well, Mike, this has been such a wonderful Wonderful conversation. And thank you so much. Um, I've put your websites on there. Uh, your, your, your link to your, to your sh uh, book is also on, on the bio. I mean, on, on the show notes, Th uh, I'll meet you backstage here in just a minute as I do my closeout, but cool. thank you so much for giving a little bit of your time today. Thanks, Teresa. This was wonderful. What a great way to start my weekend. Awesome. Awesome. All right, guys, I'm going to go full screen and just say, Thank you so much. I know this isn't my normal time to meet. So I appreciate all of you that were able to join us live. And then those of you who catch the replay. And I do see, I did have a couple comments here and a couple people who did have some comments. So we'll get to those later. Uh, Exchange podcast series said, engage, engage, engage. Great advice. Excellent show. So thank you for that. And then Mark Vasquez, he says, invest in your people and you get more in return through a better understanding of people and what motivates them. Yep. This is how you get results. So yep. true. So true. 
All right, guys, enjoy the rest of your day. I have another podcast on Sunday. This is a two one this week because I, I was out of town earlier this week. But thank you so much uh, for joining me. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Have a great weekend. And I'll talk to you guys later. Bye bye now.